Hi everyone, my name is Samantha Hill and I'm the Assistant Director of the Hana Arendt Center. Welcome to our virtual reading group. Can everyone hear me? Good, good volume. Hi everyone, nice to see you again. Um, so today we're going to be talking about three shorter pieces from the new um, edited volume. I see it on uh, I see it on several desks in the photos, Bob Howard. So it's nice to see the big fat yellow volume there. Um, Essays in Understanding 1953 to 1975, um, edited by Jerome Cohn. So we're going to be looking at um, three pieces, a letter to Robert um, M. Hutchins, Challenges to Traditional Ethics, a response to Michael Polanyi, and Reflections on the 1960 National Conventions, Kennedy versus Nixon. Um, and I believe all these pieces were published in 1960, about the same time with one another. Um, so in one way or another, I think that all three of these essays speak to questions of methodology, method in political theory, and the way that Arendt understands the work of political theory in relationship to politics. Um, but I want to take them one by one and um, just kind of walk us through some We have a personal letter, and then we have a kind of editorial opinion piece um, in response to a presidential election. So three different forms of writing. Um, in the first essay um, that I want to draw our attention to, Challenges to Traditional Ethics, a response to Michael Polanyi, I think that's a good place to start um, with these three. Um, he offers Arendt offers um, a critique of his um, work on nihilism and the liberal tradition um, in order, um, and Polanyi's attempt to think about Hitler and Stalin and the appearance of totalitarianism and fascism in the 20th century within the tradition of Western political thought, um, something that we've talked about um, before. Um, looking at her essays on personal responsibility under moral dictatorship and some of her work on thinking um, is how Arendt tries to offer a history or an account of the various elements of totalitarianism outside of the tradition of Western political thought. Um, and methodologically, that's really important to the way that she understands history outside of a determinist framework. Um, for Arendt, it's unthinkable um, to try and draw a line from Plato um, to Aristotle to Nietzsche to Hitler, right? Um, and she sees what Polanyi is doing in his work as a kind of positivist approach to political theory um, as a way of thinking about politics. So on page 180, she does something that she um, doesn't do very often in her work, um, usually only in her lectures that I'm aware of. Um, she offers a definition, actually, uh, it's not, it's a one, 186. Um, she offers a definition of political theory, of the work of theory, um, contra social scientific methodology. Um, which is becoming more and more popularized in the 1960s within the field of political science. So she says in the, the second full paragraph at the top, she lays out a kind of short summary of his argument, and then she says, this theory, Polanyi's theory, is a theory in the modern sense of the word rather than taking its cue from the phenomenal evidence and relying upon a description of what actually happened, it is a hypothesis whose truth depends on whether it will work or not. I think that this hypothesis works all right with one set of historical data, which we may identify roughly as the modern history of revolution and the formation of a kind of revolutionary character. For this development, the fact that there is such a thing as moral passion is indeed decisive. Mr. Polanyi does not tell us in so many words what this passion is, but it seems fair to infer from his paper that he thinks of the passion as perfectionism, an old heresy according to Catholic teaching. 
The psychological image underlying his argument is, I suspect, the notion of the man who sets out to achieve sainthood, then discovers that man is no man is good, just as Socrates discovered that no man is wise. Whereupon he decides that under such circumstances the best, namely the least hypocritical, is to become a villain. And she says we are familiar with this type of uh, nihilism from Russian literature. Um, and goes on. So she is setting out how her approach to understanding totalitarianism is different to Polanyi's. Um, theory is often misunderstood in the scientific sense as the development of a hypothesis or a framework that can be picked up and applied to practical political problems. And within the tradition of Western political philosophy, there are different ways of thinking about what it means to do the work of political theory. For a number of political theorists, it is problem oriented, um, meaning you identify a specific political issue and then you develop a theoretical argument to solve or address that political issue. And this starts to come out in the letter to Hutchins more so when she's helping to develop a philosophical framework for essentially a think tank um, that is going to be working on questions of democracy and republicanism. Um, but here she's reiterating um, the approach to doing political theory that she lays out um, at the beginning of the origins of totalitarianism. It has more to do with understanding than it does with um, trying to solve or get to the, the crux of to make sure it doesn't happen again. It's a different way of thinking about how it is that we approach contemporary political problems. Um, and I wanna then jump to toward the end of the essay on 189 and 190 to draw this out a little bit more. She says in the first full paragraph, there exists, however, another possibility to find a link between the moral excess and nihilistic self-doubt, which belong to the recognized history of the modern age and the political disasters which we were forced to witness in our own time. One may indeed argue that a passion for nihilistic self-doubt among intellectuals broke the dams by which the quite different passions of the many had been contained. But this argument would lead us back to the loss of dogmatic authority as such, that is, to something which, at least politically, has lost its significance beyond any hope of recovery. In our context, another point is more important. If we want to blame our moral disasters upon the loss of dogmatic authority, we shall again find ourselves in the midst of notions which have little, if any, place in the great tradition of Western thought or in the history of ideas. For politically speaking, it was the fear of hell which acted as the most potent curb upon the potential criminality of human beings. And the idea that a motive of such obvious moral inferiority as the fear of hell should have restrained man from the worst crimes is no more palatable than the notion that such an intellectually unspeakable low product as the protocols of the elders of Zion should have had the power to influence the course of contemporary events. And then she says a little bit further down on, that, on 190. Um, to summarize, I'm reluctant to follow Mr. Polanyi's argument for two reasons. I do not want to pay those who caused our disasters the undeserved compliment of having been inspired by the great tradition of Western thought. More important, I see in this, as in similar attempts, a dangerously tempting device to dodge the problems with which these disasters have confronted us, the problem of the human capacity for radical, unmitigated, absolute evil. Um, she wrote this obviously before, um, after Origins and before Eichmann in Jerusalem, um, where she kind of steps back on the concept of radical evil and then steps towards the banality of evil. But I think here we have a sense of 
the unthinkable nature of what it is people are capable of doing is one way to read that. Mr. Polanyi at one point admits that moral depravity has accomplished moral excess. This moral depravity, I would argue, was no accompaniment. It was the very crux of the whole matter. I admit that I possess no ready solution of the problem. Theoretically, I do not even know the answer to the question, what is radical evil? And as a kind of play there, she jumps back in her summary of her argument to the opening of the review. Um, and she assumes the Socratic tone of unknowingness as a way of doing theory in itself as a kind of negative mirror or juxtaposition to what it is Polanyi is doing and his approach to the question of evil in the contemporary world. So she's expositing what it is that the theorist is, she thinks, is supposed to do um, in writing and thinking. So pragmatism and positive, positivism cannot um, speak to address, account for the emergence of radical evil in the world. And our traditional concepts and categories of understanding did not give rise to Hitler and Stalin. In a lecture she gave at the University of Chicago on the tradition of Western political thought in 1956, she writes, um, she wrote that uh, the, the work of political theorist is the production of concepts. Right? Political theorists make concepts that help us to understand the world. Concepts, in a way, become like banisters that we grab onto in our thinking that allow us to think through political questions. Um, but they're, they're fungible, right? They're not fixed. She says that concepts are wellsprings. Um, concepts are never the end of an argument. They're always the beginning of an argument. They're always the beginning of thinking. Um, and so to try and pick them up and use them as a Procrustean frame to solve a political event or to think about a political event is always going to, to fail in that sense. So the vocabulary of political theory, the vocabulary that we've built up over time as part of the tradition of political thought cannot be used. Um, Polanyi's work was going to be met with a negative review by her simply by the method with which he undertook his study. Um, and instead, Arendt argues, as she does elsewhere, that we need a new form of thinking, um, new theory, new concepts, new categories, um, in order to think about the emergence of totalitarianism in the world. And this is also one of the reasons why Arendt was insisted upon reading anti-Semitic anti literature. Um, she's and she, as she says in this piece eloquently you know the an, anti-semitic literature like the lowbrow writing of the elders of zion is what came before hitler not plato right and to try and place him in that philosophical tradition is to do a disservice to the tradition um, that we have to look at the text um, and the thinking that creates um, leaders like hitler or stalin so that's the first text. Um, shall I go on to the second text and tie it to this one? And then I'll tie it to this one and then maybe we can take a pause and the Kennedy text is a little bit different. Can is I ask a question? Yes. Um, so yeah. I haven't read the Polanyi article, but is he saying, and she's contradicting it, that, um, the kind of evil that we saw in Hitler and Stalin had to do with the fact that they were in pursuit of perfectionism? Is that what he's arguing or is that what she's interpreting him as arguing? Or I'm a little confused because I haven't read the article. So we can take a look at the beginning of the article um, where she offers her reading of the, there it is, of the Polanyi. Um, so Polanyi is talking about um, the transition um, between uh, 
apolitical nihilism to political nihilism and the way that this manifests in relationship to the way we think about morality um, in his work. And I haven't read the Polanyi since graduate school, honestly, and I didn't have time to go back and reread it <laughs> to look at Arendt's piece. But this is her reading of Polanyi, and she gives this kind of neat paragraph summary at the beginning, which we can look at. Um, so she's placing it within the extant tradition of literature, typical book review. And then she says towards the bottom of page 185, Mr. Polanyi seems to imply that the activity of thinking itself once it has been liberated from dogmatic authority, tends to develop radical attitudes and to end in nihilistic self-doubt. So here we have, I'll just stop there and then we'll finish reading it, um, a critique of a turn in thinking in Western political philosophy, post Descartes, Enlightenment thinking, which is characterized by an abdication of self-authority, um, radical self-doubt, atomism, right, as a way of being in the world where we're constantly deferring our own thinking and authority. Um, and instrumentality, uh, the limits of rational, logical thinking, uh, where we excise, um, reflective critical thinking that might take into account the passions or concern for the well-being of others into our calculations. It's about um, productivity. So then she says, if this tendency is incurable because of the logicality inherent in the human mind, its tendency to drive everything into its logical extreme, should we then renounce this faculty altogether or use it only to the limited extent that it may help to solve practical problems? The theory of the paper as distinguished from its mood is new and startling. Political criminality on a gigantic scale as evidenced in both the Hitler and Stalin regimes is a thing of the past. The horror it inspired, however, that shocked recognition that everything is possible the alarmed conclusion that the very foundation of Western morality are no longer secure, the human conscience has lost its compelling power among ordinary people, that moral insanity, far from being the temporary aberration of nihilistic elite, may be a mass phenomenon. All these reactions were not only exaggerated, but mistaken in principle. For the shocking reality did not spring from any moral weakness, but on the contrary, from an unprecedented hunger for righteousness, which for more than two centuries has identified, intensified moral feelings until the stream of moral passion broke the dams which contained it and smashed the wheels which harnessed it. The horrors themselves, therefore, were moral excesses. So, there's an argument um, in political theory that the logical outcome of Kant um, is not Nazism. And this argument takes different shapes and forms, but one could hypothetically draw a line from Hobbes to Kant to the Marquis de Sade to Nazism. And that's part of the argument that gets drawn out in this paper and is referenced. Um, the Kantian universal categorical imperative as a logical structure for thinking and directing one's actions in the world taken to an extreme limit requires an absolute negation of the individual. And part of that absolute negation of the individual is an absence of a consideration for the well being of others. So, one of the things that happens that I think we talked about when we read the essay on personal responsibility is that the 
moral categories of good and bad and evil, kind of, you know, Nietzsche's stalwart categories of morality, um, are completely emptied out with the rise of the Third Reich, with the emergence of totalitarianism. And so we have this formal separation between the institutions of government and moral consciousness and the law which regulates moral consciousness and gives form to citizens. Polanyi is trying to, in Arendt's reading, is trying to draw a line within the tradition connecting the traditional concepts of morality to Hitlerism and Stalinism. And Arendt says, no, those concepts and categories broke with the emergence of Hitler and Stalin. So the logical outcome, this is me reading Arendt now, the logical outcome of Kant can't be a Plato, Hobbes, Kant, Nietzsche, so on, can't be Hitler, right? That this is coming from somewhere else. Um, and part of what she's trying to do, part of her political project in making that argument is a preservation of the tradition of Western political philosophy. Um, but also um, there's a radical openness to it. Um, it's the way I think about it. Um, she's making an argument for the need for uh, new theory, for new concepts to not take given concepts like Hobbes's conception of power, his domination, um, for granted that that should be a place from which we begin to think about how domination played out in the 20th century. It's not the framework in itself that is applied to the 20th century. It becomes something that we think with. Did I help answer your question, Daphna? Yes, I think I should read the article though. <laughs> Yes, you should always do the reading before you come to the reading group. No, I meant the Polanyi article. Oh, the Polanyi. Yes. No, yeah, read the Polanyi. I didn't have, uh, I did not go back and read the Polanyi, um, but it's worth worth reading. Yes. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Um, Howard? I, yeah. As I understand both what I read and, and uh, what you are saying, the argument is that uh, totalitarianism uh, is, uh, is not an evolution kind of thing from Western political thought, but it's a radical departure. And so, exactly. yeah. Uh, yeah, so if you follow that, I think you, you then become compelled to ask the same question about our present political situation in the United States. Well, that question, I've thought a lot about that. I mean, so the question then would be, Arendt argued that, you know, totalitar the emergence of totalitarianism in the United States was a radically new form of government. Um, we have the kind of uh, platonic, traditional, tripartite division of forms of government, democracy, oligarchy, so on. Um, and for her, totalitarianism was a new uh, thing in itself. So the question then we would have to think about is, has, has, has the nature of government fundamentally radically changed today in the United States with the emergence, to use Arendt's language, of Donald Trump? Um, I'm not sure it has yet. I don't think that we have a radically new form of government. Um, Wendy Brown, I believe, just published a piece arguing that we have a new form of government. Um, I think that the our extant political institutions have been um, are being reshaped or shifted. I'm not sure I see that as a break in tradition, um, perhaps a continuation, but I don't know. Yeah, so. <laughs> The, the thought that comes to my mind is a, a, kind of a follow-up on what I said, is mm -hmm. uh, Barbara's book, uh, uh, World Against uh, Jihad. I don't know yeah. if you're familiar with it. I haven't read it. Uh, but in, in essence, he's talking about this uh, idea of tribalism and globalization and conflict. 
Yeah. Of course, he wrote it in the middle of the 1990s, and even that's much more prevalent today, and uh, and it influences uh, more than United States politics on reflection. I mean, you look at what's happened this week between Korea and the French president over here. Now the German president is over here today, and 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 so I'm wondering, you know, with this idea of a tradition that uh, flows kind of systematically from Plato to the present, whether or not uh, that's still uh, the right way to do analysis. If I can jump in, um, after World War uh, II, there were a lot of uh, intellectuals, political scientists, even historians, who were trying to understand uh, the emergence of totalitarianism, especially the Holocaust. Yeah. In terms of, uh, there was one uh, line of thinking, uh, it was like from, from Luther to Hitler, or from Hegel to Hitler. Um, and so there was a lot of this nonsense going on. Uh, George Mossy, a longtime uh, historian of Germany and University of Wisconsin, uh, did something what Hannah Arendt was talking about, namely he was reading uh, the lowbrow garbage literature. And uh, he he tried to correct that line of thinking uh, by thinking, showing that there was- You cut out, you cut out there. Okay. Oh, can you hear me now? Sorry, I just, now I can. I didn't get the last sentence though. Oh, I, I was saying that George Mossy was reading the, uh, the lowbrow literature and uh, he saw mm -hmm. that more as the, I don't know, the cultural context out of which Hitler and a lot of Nazis to the extent that they read anything came. So yeah. it, it's not unusual for intellectuals uh, to try and uh, uh, burden or attribute more to uh, highfalutin ideas or philosophy uh, to uh, to the political situation, and and that's what Hannah Arendt is is fighting against correctly, in my view. But it it wasn't only intellectual traditions. There was this other concept, and I'm sure Sam Hill knows about it, about um, the authoritarian personality, and that the Germans were particularly prone, you know, to follow the leader. Um, which uh, I guess was more maybe the social psychological equivalent of the Luther to to Hitler arguments, but maybe she has, maybe you have a different take on maybe? that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean I, I agree with the with the first half of what you said. Um, I uh, there, I mean the. Uh, do you want me to speak to the authoritarian personality? Is that what you want? Um, I mean, not necessarily. Like, whatever you choose. <laughs> whatever, whatever I choose. I mean, the authoritarian personality was commissioned by the University of California, Berkeley. I think in 1955, 1956, um, to try and understand from a socio-psychological perspective the emergence of anti-Semitism and uh, the in, in Germany. Um, and the world, and also why it was so uh, successful rhetorically, especially in Germany. Um, it's, uh, I just finished writing an article about it, so it's very much in my head. Um, I think a lot of people have gone back to it, but there are a number of factors there, and I think the approach is somewhat different um, than Arendt's um, in trying to understand what made individuals susceptible to political rhetoric. Um, one of the things that Adorno writes about, which ties in very nicely actually in, in the authoritarian personality with the um, reflection on the Nixon-Kennedy election, is how individuals consume news in relationship to how they consume entertainment. One of the things uh, television and radio did was conflate news with entertainment so that we no longer distinguish in our leisure time, 
when we sit down in front of the television between watching the news and watching keeping up with the Kardashians or whatever it is. Um, we consume these things side by side with one another and so we process them in the same way and it's this bombardment of information um, which makes us less thinking essentially which somehow deadens our capacity for judgment. The other thing that really comes out of that volume, which Arendt never goes anywhere near, is um, traditional family structures and the need for a strong uh, authority figure um, or father figure. Um, and I think that's worth thinking about in our contemporary political context because the United States, for better or worse, is still a pretty socially conservative country. Um, most Americans have a strong attachment to the normative um, family structure, and that certainly affects our political debates here. Um, but there's a lot going on there. I, there's a, a question about Adorno in the chat box too, so it must have gotten out that I, that I read these things. Um, <laughs> should we, are there other questions on this thread or should we, um, should we, do you want to look at the Kennedy piece? Maybe we could go there and then come back to the Hutchins. Um, the letter of the Hutchins about the fund for the Republic, um, I think is fascinating because the acute political problems that she outlines in the essay all relate to certain failures of the nation, shape, nation state and how they affect individual citizens. So she is looking at practical political questions like passport, citizenship, um, the deprivation, um, and rights of asylum. And all of these political issues are so relevant to our contemporary political situation today, it felt like this could be a project proposal for a think tank that people were putting together now in order to address some of the elements of the crises um, of democracy that we're experiencing. Um, so we can, we can talk about that or we can jump to the Kennedy. I'm pretty flexible depending upon what you wanna, what you wanna look at. Um, is there a vote? I'm a, Dem I'm a Democrat. Maybe I should be more, less of a Democrat. Susan, did you just mouth something or no? Okay. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at the, um, the Kennedy versus Nixon um, essay. So, Aaron is thinking about how, television and political polling, things that have become commonplace in our politics today, were radically reshaping the American electoral process. Um, and she's writing in response to watching the televised uh, party conventions and debates between Nixon and Kennedy. And then there's this fantastic section at the end, which also feels oddly relevant to our contemporary political situation where she's reflecting upon how the Russians are shaping American political elections. And she writes this um, hypothetical letter to the Soviets, um, thinking about how Americans should take their elections separately from Russian interference. Um, so, in this essay, like the other two essays, um, though they're not all essays, one's a review, um, this is more of an essay and the other one's a personal letter. She's thinking about thinking and thinking about how we stop thinking in politics and end up towing party or ideological lines. And this is the biggest concern that she sees with the what's the word, Tele, the te televization, is televization a word? The televization of elections. Um, she argues at the outset that the candidates are essentially pre-chosen through the process of political polling 
so that individuals make up their minds about which candidate they're going to vote for before they ever have an opportunity to be um, to to hear the arguments of the candidates themselves, right? So we make the decision before we become educated about the political arguments that the candidates are making, right? So there's this kind of holding up of a traditional notion of political opinions um, and the fact that they have to be argued in public and they have to be argued well and that we should be convinced by them and that the candidates should be good rhetoricians. Um, this idea of a political candidate standing in a public space or forum giving a speech um, talking about politics and not just presenting themselves on television. Um, and so on the one hand we have the effect of television and what it's like to watch uh, political candidates on TV. And on the other, we have the uh, political polling, which is done and often commissioned directly or indirectly by the political parties, um, which let us, the voters, know which candidate has the lead, which then influences who it is that we're going to vote for. And so we end up, make, we end up making our decision um, not based upon the political arguments of the candidates but on the empirical evidence that has been provided to us right all three of these pieces in one way or another are attacking the emergent dominant trends of empiricism in politics in the united states so in this essay it takes the shape of television and political polling which is a reduction to statistical numbers. Um, so let's take a look at page 192. She starts off with this kind of fairy tale image of what American politics used to be like. Once upon a time, it was the business of national conventions to nominate their candidates for the highest public offices in the country. Then as now, nominations depended on vote getting capacity, but this capacity was only one among several factors. Behind the hoopla, the parades, the oratory, there was the smoke-filled rooms where the deals of party bosses were made and where the considered opinions of the delegates could throw their weight into the balance. In case of stalemate, there were the dark horses to be pulled out, to be shown around, and to be built up into national figures through the propaganda of the party machine. This and much more is now a thing of the past. The 1960s 16 nominations were foregone conclusions, not because the conventions were rigged, but because the vote-getting capacities of the candidates had proved themselves in the primaries and public opinion polls without the help of party machines. Okay. So we start to see here also the relationship between the lobbying industry and the polling industry and the party machinery um, in the United States. And the parties were confronted with accomplished facts not only because both candidates had built up their own organizations, but because His Majesty the voter had already decided with which alternatives he wished to be confronted. Instead of waiting patiently for the alternatives to be presented to him by the wisdom of party leadership, the important shift of power is partly due to television, plus the fact that we are confronted for the first time with a generation of men who know how to use new facilities. So whereas the political parties would put forward candidates at nominating conventions, now the candidates are essentially pre-chosen for the political parties by political polling data. So a party is not going to put a lot of money into a candidate that is not polling well um, in a state or district or nationally, depending upon the election, if they're not going to win, right? So you look for a candidate that polls well among the people. Um, Can I just jump in for a second? I, I yeah. think that, that seems really, um, it's Susan, 
I think that seems so naive. What, aren't or? This, this analysis, um, because, um, you know, the candidates were still going to be brought forward by the party machine. They didn't just pop out of nowhere. I no, mean, there's, maybe, yeah. Maybe they, the ones that polled the best wound up you know, getting nominated, but it's, it's, I mean, recently there was a story about the fact that uh, at this point, um, the Democratic Party is discouraging certain people from running as candidates, they're putting money behind other candidates, um, and so forth. So I just, this sounds so... Naive. Well, I, I don't think that she, she's not she's not holding up an ideal image of the way elections used to work in the United States or to say that another way she's not she's not contesting the way the two-party political system um, operated historically she, I think she's trying to draw attention to how it is these new forms of technology um, are reshaping American elections in the 1960s. So on the one hand, it used to work like this, but now with polling and television, it's starting to work like this. It's not, she's not making an argument for more like small D democratic driven um, selection of candidates. She's still relying on the political parties as um, institutions of American politics saying that this is happening without the help of the party machines and that the the um voter is presenting the party with who they want and i, I just through polling through 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 polling data so you so you <laughs> i just think that it's you know part of the problem that we've had is that uh, we don't get presented with options. We we have candidates who are all going to toe the party line in one way or another, and and that those people are all within a narrow range. Of Except work. now, I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's changing. It's changing right now, which is um, the poll. The poll polling failed in the last presidential election. Um, shocking political science um what was taken as fact and certain was proved uncertain that polling data is not reliable and now one of the methods i understand the democratic party to be employing in the upcoming midterm elections is intentionally sourcing candidates who can um who are who can be presented as being outside of the kind of ideological party line. Well, um, so we have this kind of what are they called blue 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 dogs? Well, I think we have this kind of return of the blue dogs and the Democratic Party is more moderate or conservative Democrats who aren't necessarily going to consistently vote straight ticket on the floor. Um, but who um, are seen as more uh, well, of, of the people. I, wanna, I don't want to use the word populist there because it's now become a kind of loaded term. You're unconvinced. <laughs> there is a couple of, let's go to the chat box. So um, on this, So Daphna, I do know the play for four square, four corners, four play. It's called four play. I knew I'd get there eventually. Um, I'll reserve my comments since this is being videotaped. Um, but we we can email about it if you want. Um, my my only question was, did did. Did Dr. Adorno, the wife, actually have a correspondence with Benjamin? I mean, was this a factual correspondence? Um, I would have to go back and check the factuality of it. I remember I read the play and it was published, um, and I don't remember it attaining directly to truth, but 
Yeah, Gretel did have a, cor a brief correspondence with Benjamin, I believe. Um, yeah, and I would love for you to write to me about your opinion. Yeah, I will, I'll have to go back. I can go back and look at it. Um, and that's an interesting question for my work. Um, Kim wants, uh, Dan, can you send the Polani essay that Aaron's responding to? Can you post that in the group here for everyone? Um, if you hear this, just you can probably Google PDF. It's probably easy to find or through the library. Um, Harold. OK, so back to the election. All too often, one thought how much better informed, more gifted, appealing the commentators and news analysts were than those who made the news and upon whom they had comment. Still true. <laughs> That's so pa. I don't, well, I, I mean, my first response is no, it's not still true. Um, I think we're watching this conversation play out um, across print and uh, television reporting today. Um, the commentators are seen to be incredibly biased and not reliable. Um, I'm not sure about the distinction between those who make the news. Do you mean the people that are being reported on and the people who are doing the reporting or the news companies and corporations who are literally kind of making the news and the people who are reporting? Do you want to say something about that, Howard? I just I'm, I want to say just something about- Harold, sorry. I don't know why I'm saying Howard. Harold, my apologies. Pat. Bob. Pat. Pat. Hi, Pat. Hi. Inter uh, coincidentally, on TCM, for those of you who have it, uh, The Best Man, the movie was on just now, which is an exact description of, an exact playing out of that first paragraph. The old way bosses and fixes and stuff like that, just to get the nomination, which is yeah. kind of interesting. The thing I liked about this particular essay was that she characterized Nixon and uh, uh, and Kennedy in a way that I thought was was different than what uh, I experienced at the time. Uh, that huh. it be, well, uh, Nixon playing out the humble uh, Truman type, and, and Kennedy playing the aspiring, you know, kind of a, a high higher level type person, um, aspirational, I should say. But so so it was a in that sense. Other things make it not so interesting. But and in, if I look at it in that particular sense, uh, I found that the, uh, the, um, my remembrances are come are come back better than they did at the time when I saw them as, you know, in, in, in how they presented themselves. I didn't see it in that angle at that time. Yeah, she, she, on page 195, she, she talks about um, how Eisenhower was the, um, ideal of the Republican Party. Um, now we have Reagan. Um, but she kind of hammers on the point that Nixon was appealing to mediocrity um, as opposed to Kennedy, who maintained this idea of um, of, of rising up. Um, it's a nice characterization of the logic of the American dream that's embedded in the Republican Party platform so that even those who make it all the way to the top, they're still average Joe down at the bottom who's still aspiring to be at the top, um, which is also one of the reasons why Donald Trump was in part so successful is he was able to appeal to that rhetoric of the average citizen um, who aspired to, who, who aspires to achieve wealth. Um, can I jump in, Sam? It's Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Um, I'm very puzzled by something I didn't see or read in this essay. Um, I mean, I enjoyed the essay, but given her other writings, that she doesn't focus more on the medium of television itself, I mean, analogous to us in these days of social media, the fact that, you know, one does not have to go to a centralized community location the whole point of television is that these messages come into the home, into one's private familial space. Yeah. 
and that's a radical shift in the society. I mean, one can say that there's more of it with social media, but it's more of uh, something that got started with that. Maybe the family before that sat around the radio, but you know, the whole, I mean, I think of the famous image of Nixon sweating in the debates. Right. Um, yeah. You know, like I learned about that. I mean, we learned about these pictures and people now have these pictures in their living rooms, kitchens and whatnot that, you know, in her childhood would not have been the case. So I guess I was curious that that wasn't integrated into what she's in her observations. Was it because she went to the conventions? It's um, surprising. It, I mean, it's, it is interesting that she doesn't um, pick up her framework of private, social, and public in order to think about how um, television is reshaping um, dialogue in the home. Um, that's I, it, that would be interesting um, to to think about um, how that plays out. Um, on page 194, she draws on some recurrent themes in her writing. Um, on at the top, she says, more important, the screen brings into view those imponderables of character and personality which make us decide, not whether whether we agree or disagree with somebody, but whether we can trust him. Um, and in this passage, which goes on a bit, <coughs> she um, is, I think, drawing our attention indirectly to part of that kind of private public distinction um, where in the home, when we're watching the candidates through the television screen, we're not rationally engaging with the arguments that they're making necessarily, but we're perceiving them as portrayed objects um, and we're having affective responses to them and we're being swayed by how it is we respond to their appearance to us as opposed to just the linguistic act of making a political argument. The television personalizes the political candidate in a way that they weren't previously personalized and that personalization affects the way that we vote um and then she says without the help yeah margaret i'm well, sorry i guess nope. going back to what susan was saying i guess i would kind of you know argue that i mean in some ways what the new uh technology did then does now is to provide some sort of facade of control over the process where, you know, whatever today's equivalent of the smoke-filled back room is, uh, you know, they still exist on whatever side of whatever aisle you're talking about. Um, I mean, you know, I can do grassroots organizing all I want. Centralized decisions get done in centralized ways. But if I'm on Facebook or on and watching TV or whatever, you know, and talking back to it or sharing with friends, there's this um, not delusion, fantasy, basically, that somehow I'm participating in the event that is really just on screen for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think if I was going to, if I was going to pursue that line and thinking about how Arendt deals with these new forms of technology in relationship to politics, I might look at the end of the human condition when she's talking about worldly alienation um, and how new forms of technology um, are essentially, um, well, alienating in a certain sense, um, but does somebody, do other people want to jump in on this? In some countries, the electoral process is different so that in effect that back, back room with the cigar smoke boys club hanging out and making the decisions still exist. Maybe they I think, have a few more women in them, but still, it's still basically that way, and it's not the same system, obviously. But say in in parliamentary 
governments that uh, have parties where the leader of the party is chosen in inside these closed doors and then presented to the public as this is our leader, um, and it existed in Hannah Arendt's time too, um, I think it still happens in a lot of countries, and I don't necessarily recommend it. No, I think it still happens. I think I think part of Margaret, if I was hearing Margaret right, you know, this is this is still happening in the United States. It just looks differently now. You know, we're not people aren't literally sitting in rooms smoking cigars, probably because yeah. cigar smoking indoors has mostly been banned. But I think one <laughs> of the points that, that Arendt's making here is that these the 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 rise of these polling apparati, right, have essentially kind of taken over the work of the back room and in a way have, you know, so at the beginning when she uses this ironic, like his majesty, the voter has now presented the candidate to the party. She's using that tone for a reason, right? It's not actually that it's more democratic, that it's the people, the demos willing or choosing from, you know, the people a political leader to represent them. It's that they're still being chosen by 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 institutional apparatuses that have a, a politics, right? That are that are after a certain political end. You can manipulate polling data. I mean, this is something the United States is reeling from right now after the election of Donald Trump and the revelations of Cambridge Analytica um, and the way in which the voters themselves were influenced by these various voices that inserted themselves into the election process. And I think this is a huge problem for democracy. It's one of the reasons why we end up with this new wave of populism in America, which is very idiosyncratic form of populism, right? Where people are disillusioned with government. And this has kind of, you know, been the rhetoric for a long time, but part of that frustration, disillusionment, antagonism toward traditional political parties rises from the fact that it's very obvious to see that I, as Jane Doe voter, you know, don't actually have a lot of direct say in the formation of public policy or in the election of political officials. And yet we perform this act of citizenship in voting every two, four years, so on. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a distance between those two things. We just had David Van Raybrook give a talk um, at Bard uh, last, uh, last week, Tuesday, Monday, I can't remember. And um, Monday. it's fantastic. Monday. We, Monday, thanks, sorry. Um, the video, if it's not already up, will be up soon. And Van Raybrook, like uh, Jim Fishkin, who spoke at the Crisis of Democracy conference last fall, is trying to think about ways in which we can democratize democracy, is the phrase he uses, but the ways in which we can draw in um, individual voices into the formation of public um, of public policy, of legislation, um, a way of essentially democratizing um, polling or using polling for democratic purposes more organically than the way it's being used now to impose politics on us. I mean, I think we have to move, we have to figure out um, the political parties as institutions, which have become kind of concretized in our imaginaries, have to figure out a way um, to deal with with average voter disillusionment if they're going to remain, right? We don't need to have a two-party political system. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say there's two political parties or that there's a Democratic Party and a Republican Party. Um, but these things have come into existence over time and, we're and they've changed a lot over time. And we're in a kind of shift moment um, being driven by um, people's anger towards backroom politics, which they um, hear as a synonym for institutional party politics these days. A word about, oh, I'm sorry, Howard, go ahead. Pat, Howard. Thank you, Pat, thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I want to stick with last Monday night. I'm in Florida, so I couldn't attend, but I'm looking forward to seeing the video. Yeah. But I think that 
there is a real question today as to whether or not the electoral process itself, itself um, uh, is democratic or is, is consistent with democracy, uh, whether or not it's been captured now. So it's, it's just a, a, another marketing method uh, to uh, sell someone. In this particular case, it's a ruler who takes command of a country or a state. And, uh, and I think this is a serious question that has to be debated. And there are certainly other alternatives uh, that are uh, worthy of consideration and discussion. And so uh, 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 I, th I think you brought up an important point. Uh, uh, I think Monday night was important. Uh, Fishkin is important. Uh, is his name Guerrera from? Uh, Guerrera, yeah. Yeah, he's important when he talks about lotocracy. And uh, uh, this is not something to just fluff off. I think it's really critical to uh, our political system. Absolutely. Yeah. Pat, did you want to? Just a word about parties, political parties. Uh, with, the, with the huge amount of money involved in federal and even now state elections, uh, parties do become kind of an offshoot. But at the local level, uh, parties are very important because if you decide you want to run for something locally and you don't have any political experience, you can go to a party. They might have some money to help you out to get you started and educate you on how you go about running for public office at the local mm -hmm. level. So uh, to dispense with parties altogether to me is, and let us, you know, how, you know, we don't all, you're not going to have a PAC, a super PAC when you're running for town council or whatever it is you're running for locally. So just not that we shouldn't forget that a party structure, although it's obviously has its down, you know, bad version, uh, bad parts, has a, has a function in our country as it is right now. But I certainly agree with Howard, the changes have to be made, electoral college get rid of it and that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd just like to enforce what Pat said, and it's also part of the same problem. Uh, you can't look at local politics and state politics and national politics and international politics as necessarily having the same elements for governance. And so I think that each has to be looked at independently. And I think that the political system works much better locally than it does as you go up the line in, in population mass. Uh, so I think that's also something to consider. Yeah. I think um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, Van Raybrook um, talked about was that citizens aren't disillusioned with local government so much as they're disillusioned with federal government and that they associate political parties um, with federal government more so than local or state politics, um, which, which, which seems right to me. Um, I'm going to go back to some of the comments over here on polling. So Connell wrote, she's observing things as they are in scare quotes in 1960s. Do you want to speak? Do you want to speak to that Connell? I don't know if you just shook your head no, or if you're, looks like you're, <laughs> no, leave it off. I think she's observing things in the 1960s. Um, she's, she watched, she watched the televised debates and she was, she was struck by the presentation of the candidates and the way that she saw politics beginning to play out at the time. And this is her observation of that. Um, Jennifer wrote, I agree with Arendt on polling. I think people can be swayed by deep prejudices, gender traditions, and what makes a good candidate if they are female, for instance. And polling allows people to stop thinking and rest on their deep feelings of old traditions. I think that's Arendt's primary concern is that, you know, we hear the numbers, oh, you know, this person has a 10 point lead, you know, they're going to win, or then we fall to the lesser of two evil arguments between the candidates, even if there is an insurgent candidate. And, the, and I think that's one of the points that Arendt's drawing out on that first page is that at least in the backroom smoke-filled days, there was a greater space for insurgent candidates to appear on the convention floor and pick up the vote than there, uh, than there is now with polling. 
In the US, we have a tradition of male leaders. Do we want to call that a tradition, Jennifer? And clearly it has stayed this way. Do you want to um, add something to that? Not a tradition. Well, okay, I'm here. Um, Hello. So is it a tradition? Well, um, I think it is a tradition because I think that here in the United States, unlike European countries, we don't have the history of female leaders and females as commanders in chief. And I think if you grow up with that image of a woman who waged war, you're a little bit more able to open up your thinking to accept a woman as commander in chief. And we don't have that in the United States. So that if you take Hillary, for instance, on the Iraq war resolution, she was vilified for it. Yep. And um, then when 2016 came along, that was in 2008, when 2016 came along, the goalposts shifted and it was no longer IWR, that it became the crime bill. So it, it's like, there's always a reason to not take the female. And I, I that's just a Hillary example, but I see it in may, mayoral um, um, elections too, that people lean towards males to lead in these high up, where you're taking the whole city, the whole state, the whole country. Right. I think, well, I mean, here the, I think the authoritarian personality might be a little more helpful because there's yeah. a kind of at least psychological explanation of uh, voter fascination with male authority figures. Although I'm not sure we wanna buy into that Freudian framework. Um, Hillary was a bad candidate. Um, she was a bad party candidate um, for a number of reasons. Uh, she doesn't play well on TV. That's part of it. She doesn't come across well, I think. Um, she, uh, the, the basket, bucket of deplorables comment and ensuing comments since reveal, I think, a degree to which she's out of touch with um, the with the um, general feeling of the country right now and the way the country has been moving since the 80s. Um, people feel like they've been abandoned by the government and she there she stood accusing them for their own abandonment. Whereas Donald Trump came along and said, hey, we've been ignoring you here. Let me Let me use my platform to give voice to your politics. Um, right, but but the the latest information that came out was that people voted for him because of fear of status of being white, and that the economic groups in the country that feared economics, you know, that were concerned with economics, actually voted for her, like Lily Ledbetter, you know. The, yeah. Yeah, I think that they're different. I think they're different fears about economics. Um, I think, what was it, something like a, a vast majority of upper class white women with college education voted for Donald Trump. Um, Donald Trump appealed to, I think something that Arendt starts to, she touches on it in this essay, um, is the kind of American fascination with crisis. Um, you know, Donald Trump utilized the rhetoric of, um, the, a traditional notion of the na nation state community belonging and he created an other um, that he alone could save us from, which included um, econ economic stagnation, right? I think which, that which, we... is, which, which is very real in the United States. Um, I think that the United States is um, still fairly conservative. I wrote an article last winter about what people are watching on TV. And you, if you look at which um, television networks are actually making money right now, what people are actually watching, um, it's the, the, the voter, the map of the country, the primary presidential election map of the country actually breaks down along the same lines as what people are watching on TV. So people in the red states that voted for Donald Trump um, across the middle are watching the Hallmark Channel and 
and sports. And those are the only two networks that are actually making money right now. Um, and if you watch what's on those television channels, you know, they're very much uh, heteronormative portrayals of white American families. Um, if they polled Hillary voters and Trump voters and Hillary voters said they were more likely to watch television shows with um, uh, queer characters, um, non-normative family structures, um, shows with violence, um, and Trump voters said that they were more likely to uh, turn off the channel if they saw a gay couple or a black person um, on the TV. Um, you know, I think this very much relates to the way that we consume media in relationship to the way that we um, vote for candidates. What we watch and what we listen to and what we read shores up our political sentiments. Jennifer, you were going to yeah. jump back in. Do you want to? Um, I mean, I think. I didn't want to cut you off. The issue, that's all right. I mean, the issue of, of white voters and the television and all that, I get it. But I guess I lean more towards looking at what people, the people of color who voted for her, which was yeah. definitely in the majority. And I don't think they're watching Hallmark, or maybe they are, I don't know, or the sports. I don't, you know, I don't really care. But um, the fact that she swept the South on Super Tuesday gives me great hope for the people in America. And that the white group that voted for her obviously are increasingly becoming a minority. I mean, we're already a minority in California, so maybe I see this a little bit differently. I don't, I don't see those white voters as a majority. I see them as a minority. And that's why the Electoral College worked for him, whereas she had the popular vote. So I don't know if she was really such a bad candidate as the Electoral College kind of did her in, because if we didn't have that, she would have won, and she would have won with that coalition that she did win with. Yeah, I'm, with I'm a little wary of that rhetoric. I mean, I think the, the interesting voters that we should be looking at, the, the, four million, the four million people who voted for Barack Obama, who voted for Donald Trump, um, and thinking about, and mostly in the South, thinking about why um, those people turned to Donald Trump after voting for Barack Obama and um, how the Democratic Party might appeal to them in the midterm elections next fall. Um, you know, we, we do have an electoral college constitutionally. We don't have a Democratic and a Republican Party. Um, Can and, I say something about Hillary? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I agree with Jennifer. I think that in some respects, the bias against Hillary started well before the um, elections, and I think that she was mismatched. And I think that you could quote one horrible mistake that she made with the basket of deplorables, whereas the number of horrific, <laughs> totally unacceptable things that Trump said during that campaign, <laughs> we don't bring yeah. up. And I think that we're not allowed to say them on this uh, virtual reading group. Yeah. Yeah. Dan will have and to edit. the thing of it is, is that too, too many, even in Nova Scotia, which is not exactly a voting part of the Electoral College of the United States. Uh -huh. I mean, people here were biased against Hillary from yeah. way, way back. And so she's been in the public eye as a woman, as a very strong mm -hmm. woman, and she's got a mm -hmm. history. Whereas Trump appeared out of nowhere as this entrepreneurial giant who was going to rescue America. It was an <laughs> imaging problem. I, I think, think it was, I agree, Daphne, I think it was a huge image problem. I, and I think it was very short-sighted of the Democratic Party as an institution to insist upon her as the candidate. And it did not play well for a number of reasons. The idea that she somehow had a claim on the nomination after losing to Barack Obama only reaffirmed in the voters' mind the fact that elections are um, curated by the parties and not by the voters themselves. Her nomination was symbolic of voter disenfranchisement. Um, among, I think, a lot of these um, voters that Jennifer was pointing toward. Um, when I say she wasn't a good candidate, it's not just the one con comment. It has also a lot to do with those 
factors. She wasn't, um, I think, you know, the other, the other part, the other side of this is that, you know, Trump seems so deplorable that we couldn't imagine him being elected within these public institutions of politics. Um, and we've, we've seen how that has played out. Um, Bob wrote, Hillary Clinton was completely unfamiliar figure. So are you pushing back, Bob? Trump, as much of a turd as he was in so many ways, was unfamiliar. We no knew and know many Trumps. We don't know anyone like Hillary. Do you want to jump into yeah. the conversation, Bob? Yeah, I mean, we all know so many men and women and people who are in between. Um, growing up, I knew people like Trump, not to that extent. Um, I knew nobody like Hillary. Yeah. Uh, she, she just did not have any common touch. Uh, she seemed, uh, she seemed like a phony. And of course, her, uh, her philanthropy, uh, was also a bit of a phony. You know, if, uh, Saudis give a, a million dollars to the, the Clinton Foundation. It's because the Saudis are such great people, such uh, wonderful phil philanthropists. No, it was for access. Um, so she, she just was unable, I think, to, to reach out to people uh, on their own basis. And uh, Trump, as, you know, removed or different, from us as he was, you know, nevertheless, there was a little bit of charm to him. You know, he does seem to, at, at times, uh, to be honest, uh, you know, even if it's an act or, you know, even if it's Are bullshit. Are you mean the appearance of honesty or actual honesty? Uh, frank, frankness. Frankness. At, at times he seems to be frank. Right when he's on, when he's performing his unscripted self, <laughs> the sleaze didn't overcome the frankness. Yeah. You missed the sleaze bag. <laughs> How did you listen? Hillary won the election. Can we just say that to those of us who, who actually thought that she wasn't? She did not win. Candidate. Look, she did not win. Well, she if she did, or, if she did not win. The election with redoing the election. Can I make a stupidly? I'm going to make a comment about male female stuff. Um, as far as European uh, political things, where women do take a, or are at the top of the heap, I think Europe, between this first world war and you know the combination of the first world war and the second world war, Europe had to sort of reinvent itself. Each nation had to reinvent itself. And it's sort of like when people say we should have a who favor a constitutional convention. I think they're sort of saying we should take a look at some of the things that, that are, are in this country, not about male female stuff, but sure. that's what happened in Europe. They reinvented themselves and the, the people who were doing the work got the benefit of it and people worked their way up. You know, Merkel came from you know East Germany and to and 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 rose to the top of of, of Germany and for a long period of time. So it wasn't a fluke. Uh, but all I want to say about that male female is we're not going to reinvent ourselves. So you know you're going to get people like Hillary having to work their way up the way that she had to do it and did it successfully. Sorry to say it, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know who was, didn't like Hillary all that much. She's just a woman who had to work her way up in the context of American politics, and, and she did. And, and the Saudi stuff, tell me, uh, versus how Hillary, what's the connection between the foundation and Hillary as a candidate? I don't understand it. You, you look at uh, uh, Donald Trump's history of business, and you look at Hillary's lifetime of whatever she did, and you can't even, I mean, it's not even, I don't I can't say any more about it, it's so ridiculous. It's a it's it's a difficult topic, um, and I think a lot of us are very personally attached to the to the outcome of the last election. I want to just actually before we before we have to disband, and then I'll jump back to the chat box. I want to just go back to the text um, on 198 and the postscriptum that Arendt wrote, where she writes about the experience of watching this election unfold. 
and where she draws it into conversation with the Soviets and she says, let me add a few words. I watched the television debate of the candidates, a rather disheartening experience. It got a bit better when they were confronted with concrete questions, but not much better. They got caught in details, did not know how to spell them out in the light of principles, so that Mr. Nixon's, we agree about the goals, we differ only about means, seemed like an understatement. In the direction of an overstatement, one could have said, they agree about everything, except a couple of technical details, which they should be able to straighten out with the help of some competent economist. Um, you know, we're still having this debate today about the difference between the between the candidates. And then she says, the trouble as I see it was this, both candidates accepted the rules laid down by Mr. Khrushchev. Coexistence means competition between Russia and the United States and economic growth. Moreover, economic growth is to be measured by economic growth in Soviet Russia. This I think is totally wrong. Our economic growth is a question of domestic needs of a growing population in the United States. Our attitude to Russia in these matters can only be the same as our attitude to all countries in the world which have not yet reached American conditions of prosperity and abundance. Instead of figuring out the growth percentages and entering into this insane competition, and then she goes on and she says, this is what we should say to the Russians, which essentially means, you know, which essentially says, you know, we're really happy that you're looking towards our economic develop model of development, but you should also um, think about the relationship that economic prosperity has to liberty, um, which you don't have. And so she ends on the note that in our increase in wealth does not stimulate productivity and eventually prosperity in other parts of the world, especially backward regions, we shall earn hatred and not admiration for our system. So she's thinking about the ways in which the United States' relationship with Russia in the 1960s is shaping its international image among other countries in the world as well. And I think we're still living in this kind of shadow today um, of the Cold War which may or may not have um, ended. Um, there's a lot of comments. It looks like the, the debate's continuing in the chat, chat box. Um, Bob's was not, Connell says, was not Hillary Clinton's campaign organization strategy and delivery inadequate? I think it was, Connell. Um, <laughs> inadequate, um, but that's me. Um, I don't, I, I own opinions on the election. Jennifer wrote Bob's comment on the Saudi information is not true, which I think Pat was speaking to. Um, and then Trump lied, yes, Trump lied continually. And then Daphna said, Trumpo, Trumpo, came out of a long Western intellectual tradition of snake oil salesmen. Intellectual tradition? What do you mean by intellectual tradition, Daphna? I meant Elmer Gantry. <laughs> I was being entirely flippant. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I don't appreciate... see anything intellectual about Trump. I appreciate the, the play on Orient and the flippancy. Um, yes, thank you, Patrick. So are the thank yous to Patrick from Kim and Daphna and Jennifer responding to the comment about Saudi Arabia? Is that what we're responding to? Mm -hmm. Somebody said, mm-hmm. No, in general, to his defense of Hillary and his argument was perfect, I thought. Okay, good. So, We have a few minutes left. Do you want me to kind of give a brief synopsis of the letter to Hutchins, if you want to go back and read it in the last few minutes? And then Dan, know what he was saying about Hillary. Ah, so, yeah, the defense of Hillary. Okay, good. Um, so Robert M. Hutchins um, oversaw um, the fund for the Republic which in 1956, um, he transformed into a program um, that was designed to 
look at the state of free men within society and to look at um, basic issues of democracy, um, civil liberties, um, and political institutions within the United States. Um, and so they looked at, a team of researchers looked at practical political problems. And this is Arendt um, at the University of Chicago at the time consulting um, on the fund that Hutchins is running. And Hutchins, I mean, is everyone familiar with Hutchins? He's, um, he, he helped start, I believe, the, the Great Books um, program at the University of Chicago and was behind the kind of intellectual shift there at the time and is a, um, wrote about pedagogy, I believe, quite a bit. Um, I don't know too much about him, just that. Um, but so Arendt divides her approach um, methodologically um, into three separate parts, latent problems, basic ideas, and acute problems, and sees all of them interacting together. So I think this is actually a really um, excellent example of what a project proposal for a think tank might look like addressing different methodological approaches to practical political problems. Um, and so she's discussing different ways in which we can think about the political problems then of the day um, from a traditional political philosophical perspective, combining forms of theoretical and empirical research, pushing against the grain of political science at the time. Um, and the three acute problems that she focuses on in the essay all relate in one way or another to statelessness and refugees. Um, so I think I mentioned them earlier, passports, citizenship, the deprivation of citizen, citizenship and the right to asylum. Um, thinking about how the nation state um, grants rights to citizens and what happens when those rights, um, are, when the promise of those rights kind of fails. Um, so in the essay, she draws upon um, the private, social, and political distinction and begins by looking at questions of religious freedom and the separation of church and state. And she argues that the politization of the separation of church and state um, using the separation, using religion politically um, undermines or challenges the separation between church and state and is dangerous. So she identifies that as a political problem. It's a interesting political, I'm not political problem, political question, I might say that we still have today thinking about the way um, Republican evangelicals, um, the role that Republicans and uh, evangelicals play in American elections. And then she looks at, she looks at um, moving to acute issues, she looks at the question of equality and discrimination. So equality exists in the public sphere and for her has a lot to do with the need for dignity and recognition. Um, but in the private sphere, in the private realm, um, we have the right to discrimination, right? Um, discrimination and judgment. Um, and then she draws this in, question of segregation and forced segregation um, into conversation with the question of federalism. So uh, one of her most controversial essays, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, her essay on the crisis of Little Rock, which addresses Brown versus the Board of Education, argues that um, it was the wrong decision. Um, and here she draws that into conversation with what she sees as the great virtue, one of the great virtues of American republicanism, which is the separation of powers, um, which she traces to Montesquieu. The United States, instead of having condensed power, um, separated power without weakening power between the three branches of government. And so when the federal government steps in and tries to um, change the will of the state, that takes away from the force of the separation of powers, right? So those are the constitutional grounds on which she wants to um, re reject that Supreme Court decision. Um, 
And then on page 97, she starts to, she draws these questions into conversation with her conception of the, of the three realms, the basic issues. So she says, the basic issue here concerns the distinction and relation among the three realms in which we move constantly, the public realm in which we are citizens, the social in which we earn our living, and the private in which we need to be reasonably free from both public and social, and which therefore is hidden and protected by the four walls. The recent intrusions into privacy offer a welcome opportunity to elucidate issues about which political science has been silent for centuries, right? So she's thinking about the public-private distinction as a kind of crux of base issues for these acute issues that are playing themselves out on the political scene. And then she works through them, the passport the passport issue, um, which relates primarily to movement and the freedom of movement. Um, movement is central to her conception of freedom and should not be constrained. Um, the deprivation of citizenship as punishment. And then on page 99, she says, the basic issue involved is the following. As long as mankind is nationally and territorially organized in states, the stateless person is not simply expelled from one country, native or adopted, but from all countries, none being obliged to receive and naturalize him, which means he is actually expelled from humanity. So here, this section of her proposal is echo echoing um, that part of the origins of totalitarianism where she's talking about the right to have rights. Um, the Third Reich proved that a state as a right granting institution is not held accountable for the granting of rights. And the, so rights are a question of our common humanity and not of the nation state. And if somebody takes away your citizenship, it doesn't just mean you lose your citizenship of that country, you're not a citizen anywhere. And so you're a stateless person. Um, and for her, that statelessness is connected to the loss of humanity and modernity. And then the right to asylum on page 100, when she's talking about the United Nations and the and political refugees. And then she moves on to latent issues um, where she talks about crisis and McCarthyism. And on page 102 to 103, she draws them together. And that's the cliff note version because we're out of time. <sighs> and Thank hopefully you, that's a little helpful. Thank you. Um, Dan posted our next meeting and readings in the chat box. Thank you. So we are going to be meeting on May 11th and discussing the Hungarian Revolution and totalitarian imperialism. Um, and I believe Roger will be joining you then and I will also be here. Thank you.